Good evening, you're watching News Mongolia on MNB World, and I'm your host, Irtundatla Inga Mokhlan. For our top stories, Mongolia presents a report on the implementation of the UN Convention Against Torture. A 13-year-old cancer survivor inspires hope through music and charity. High school students participate in the Open Foreign Affairs Ministry event. Stay tuned for other news. The 81st session of the United Nations Committee Against Torture is currently being held in Geneva from October 28th to November 22nd. Reports from six countries, Jordan, Cameroon, Kuwait, Mongolia, Namibia and Thailand on implementing the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman or Degrading Treatment or Punishment are being reviewed during the session. In compliance with its obligations as a state party to the Convention, Mongolia submits reports to the Committee within one year of ratification and every four years after that, detailing the measures taken to implement the treaty. Mongolia submitted its third periodic report in 2021, addressing the Convention's implementation and previous recommendations made by the Committee. A delegation led by Myanmar, Secretary General of the Ministry of Justice and Home Affairs, represented Mongolia during the committee's open sessions on November 12th and 13th. The delegation provided updates on legislative reforms, policies, and actions taken since the submission of the third periodic report and answered committee members' questions. The delegation included representatives from the Ministry of Justice and Home Affairs, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Permanent Mission in Geneva, the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection, the Office of the Prosecutor General, the Independent Authority Against Corruption, the General Executive Agency of Court Decisions, the General Intelligence Agency, the General Police Department, and the Mongolian Immigration Agency. The committee is scheduled to release its concluding observations and recommendations regarding Mongolia's report on November 22nd. Borholan, a brave 13-year-old who has triumphed over cancer, is turning her life story into an inspiring musical journey of compassion. Dreaming of becoming a professional singer, she participates in singing contests and events, captivating audiences with her talent and resilience. Beyond her passion for music, Barhotlan channels her energy into helping others. She generously donates a portion of her earnings to support young oncology patients, offering them not just financial aid, but also hope and encouragement. I've already forgotten about painful medications and treatments because I have a dream. Her story is powerful testament to the strength of the human spirit and the impact of kindness, proving that challenges can be transformed into force for good. Barholan continues to inspire her community with her determination, talent and selflessness. Now that I've recovered from cancer, I've learned to play piano and guitar. I'm also working to improve my English language skills and studying Chinese. I often visit the National Center for Maternal and Child Health. I've noticed there are younger kids and older teenagers who are undergoing cancer treatment. Younger kids talk to me about their struggles, and I try to boost their morale. When it comes to teenagers, maybe due to puberty, it's a little difficult for them to open up. After each gig or performance, she tries to donate something to the hospital. Sometimes she donates medical supplies. Of course, it's difficult to buy big equipment, but she tries to at least donate some essential disposable items. I belong to an entertainment agency, and I had two solo performances. I try to donate part of my income to children dealing with cancer. Of course, they need medical supplies and medication. In December, Borholan will take part in International Forum for Young Cancer Survivors. There, she will share her story, connect with peers from around the world, and further her mission of spreading hope and positivity. 
болоод. Children who survived cancer take part in the forum. After the forum, I'll visit the National Center for Maternal and Child Health. Your mental and emotional state is very important when you are being treated for cancer. It's really important to distract children with cancer from their disease, as the treatment takes quite a while. So if the kid has interests like painting or singing, please try to support that hobby to boost their morale. Each year, approximately 100 to 120 children in Mongolia are diagnosed with cancer, highlighting the need for greater awareness, support and resources to combat pediatric cancer. You're watching News Mongolia. Let us take a look at Mongolia's current affairs. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs has implemented the Open Foreign Affairs Ministry initiative since September 2024. The program provides high school and university students studying international relations with foundational knowledge about foreign policy and its objectives. On November 15th, the event welcomed seniors from Otambatar's High School No. 39. Participants gained insights into Mongolia's foreign relations, landscape, and the ministry's operations. The students were actively engaged in the session, asking questions about the unique aspects of diplomatic service, showing their interest and enthusiasm. Now let's shift our attention to currency exchange rates provided by the Mongol Bank. Now let's turn our attention to foreign news provided by our international partner news agencies. Distractions were bigger than deals in the first week of United Nations climate talks, leaving a lot to be done, especially on the main issue of money. In week one, not a lot of progress was made on the issue of how much money rich countries should pay to develop one's move away from dirty fuels, cop with rising seas and temperatures and pay for damage already caused by climate-driven extreme weather. But more is expected when government ministers fly in for week two to handle the hard political deal making at the negotiations known as COP29 in Baku, Azerbaijan. Countries remain about a trillion dollars a year apart in the big numbers to be settled. United Nations Environment Program Executive Director Inger Andersen said it's too early to judge what will end up after just one week, highlighting there is still another week to go. Clearly the biggest issue is the new collective quantified goal. I mean, that's, that's the conversation piece, that's a big delivery, deliverable of this COP, and that's the most complex thing. And, and so, you know, that it, that's what the world will want out of this. And so I think um, this is where we should be watching. Um, we're not there yet, but we have one more week. And so let's see where it lands at the end of the week. Alliance of Small Island States Chair, Kedrix Chester, who is also the Environment Minister of Samoa, a Pacific island impacted by rising seas, said that there was still a lot to work out, but progress had been made. Still a lot to be uh, sorted out, but there's been progress. Um, there's few concerns that we have. Uh, we're here, this being a finance cop, and we need a, an NCQG that is going to be workable, that acknowledges and recognizes the special needs of the most vulnerable. The technical details that are worked out by negotiators now have to give way to the bigger, harder number decisions made by climate and finance ministers to make more political decisions, said Ani Daskupta, president of World Resources Institute. 
Ministers will also be consulting with their bosses half a world away and seven hours behind at the group of 20 countries, the G20, in Brazil from Monday. The G20 is comprised of the world's richest nations, who are also responsible for 77% of planet heating gases being spewed. Usually, the second week is when the COP presidents take over and push sides together for a deal. Different negotiations presidents have different styles. Last year's president used sharp elbows to get things done, upsetting some people. That's not the style of this year's COP29 president, Mohtar Babayev. Babayev struck an optimistic tone in a statement to the Associated Press on how things are looking at the halfway point. Much of the news from the talks' first weeks came from outside the negotiation rooms. Host country president Ilham Aliyev triggered a few distractions himself. His combative welcome speech not only blasted neighbor Armenia and Western mainstream media, but he called oil and gas, chief causes of climate change, a gift from the gods. And then he got into a verbal spat with France, prompting the environment minister to pull out from the talks. Argentina called its delegation home in what may be a preview for the right-wing ruled country pulling out of the Paris Climate Agreement. At the same time, a letter signed by a former United Nations Secretary General and ex-top climate negotiators called for a dramatic reform of the talks. But several authors said the letter was being misinterpreted. Activists blasted the talks as being too wedded to fossil fuels, citing Aliyev's comments, the fact that Azerbaijan is a big oil producer and that more than 1,700 people connected to the fossil fuel industry were part of the negotiations. Some top leaders already at the climate talks expressed cautious optimism but added that the larger goal of climate talks should be front and center next week. Russia on Sunday launched a massive drone and missile attack on Ukraine, described by officials as the largest over the past months, targeting energy infrastructure and killing civilians. Two people were killed in the Odessa region, where the attack damaged energy infrastructure and disrupted power and water supplies, said local government Ole Kiper. President Volodymyr Zelensky said that Russia had launched a total of 120 missiles and 90 drones in the large-scale attack across Ukraine. Various types of drones were deployed, he said, including Iranian-made Shahids as well as cruise, ballistic and aircraft-launched ballistic missiles. Ukrainian defenses shot down 140 air targets, Zelensky said in a statement on the Telegram messaging app. Explosions were heard across Ukraine on Sunday, including in capital Kyiv, the key southern part of Odessa, as well as the country's west and central regions, according to local reports. One person was injured after the roof of a five-story residential building caught fire in Kyiv's historic center, according to the head of Kyiv city military administration, Serhii Popko. At least two people were killed and six injured, including two children, in the eastern city of Mykolaiv, according to local government Vitaly Kim. Fears are mounting about Moscow's capacity to devastate power infrastructure and cause countrywide blackouts ahead of the harsh East European winter. Russian strikes have hammered Ukraine's power generation capacity since Moscow's all-out invasion of its neighbor in February 2022 prompting repeated emergency power shutdowns and nationwide rolling blackouts. Ukrainian officials have routinely urged Western allies to bolster the country's air defenses to counter assaults and allow for repairs. Well, that's all for today. Thank you for staying with us. We'll see you tomorrow with more news and updates. Goodbye and good night.